We are back on Morning Line. Thanks for joining us. Attorney Clint Kelly with us talking malpractice cases, 737-7587. If you got a question or comment, give us a ring. Don't sit on it because you have a year statute of limitations. We've got May waited through the break. Good morning, May. Uh, good morning. Um, Murray Regional, um, they have hospitalists where uh, when you go to the hospital, your doctor doesn't go. Uh, from what I've seen, young men who are doctors uh, are your doctor who has never seen you before. I had an elderly friend who uh, was in a really bad shape, went to the hospital. Her, her doctor wouldn't go. He said, no, the hospitalist will be there. Very young man who knew nothing about her came in and uh, to me, no sympathy, just saw this elderly woman, never seen her before. Her outcome was really bad. She died. Uh, but is this going on everywhere? Uh, okay. Are there hospitals where your doctor will see you at the worst time in your life? Or do they turn you over to these hospitalists? And I will... Okay, thank you for your call. Uh, you seem like you're familiar with that term oh, she man. used. All right, fill me in on this, because if I go to the hospital for something, my general practitioner is at another office. I um, mean, he has not been there with me, but I think her situation sounded a little different. May, that is the best question I've gotten really? on this show in months, okay? Really? The answer to your question is yes, it's happening everywhere. Okay. And we could spend an entire show on this, but let me let me address some of these points that May okay. raised, okay? Shoot. First of all, she's absolutely correct. The hospitalists, these are not employees of the hospital. These are doctors that are, are staffed by other companies to work in the hospitals for shifts, typically seven days long, 12 hours a day for that seven day shift, okay? And they are assigned to the patients by the hospital to care for the patients in place of what used to be when we were younger, mm -hmm. and particularly going back previous generations, where the family doctor or the family internist would come in and see the patient and make rounds and be the quote unquote ah. attending, okay. okay? So that's the change. Why are doctors, or excuse me, why are hospitals doing this? Money. Oh, sure. Money. Secondly, the problem with this is the lack of continuity of care. You get some guy in there that doesn't know anything about your medical history, who has to all of a sudden make major decisions about your health care, and that person has really no relationship with you whatsoever. Might he consult with your doctor? Or he, he, or might, he might, he might, it depends on your doctor and the mm -hmm. quality of your doctor. But think about this, what happens on day six where you've seen this hospitalist, he leaves on day seven because his shift is over, day eight, another hospitalist comes in who you have never seen before, mm. who knows nothing about your history, and he's got to learn everything that's happened with you for however long you've been in the hospital oh, wow. and make decisions. And the scary thing is when doctor number two who comes in does not do the proper investigation in your history and makes bad decisions because he wasn't there, okay? Has this resulted in lawsuits? Yes, and I've had them. Okay. I've had many cases like this. I've sued hospitalists multiple times, and I'm going to continue to sue multiple hospitalists because this situation is bad. How long has this been going on? Years. Oh, okay. Years. This is not new. May, May says it happens at Murray Regional. It happens at every hospital that I can think of, ex except for Vanderbilt. Now, Vanderbilt's different because it's a teaching hospital. But all the private hospitals, all the public hospitals, the GTLA, uh, government uh government hospitals they have this service and it is not being handled properly it's just that simple and who are these hospitalists these hospitals are internal medicine doctors family doctors general <coughs> practitioners many of them who I'm not going to say they're fly by night that's not that's not fair but many of them will go from one hospital to another hospital to another hospital some of them won't even stay in the city more than a couple of years and they go somewhere else mm -hmm. That is what suffices now for attending care in mo most of our hospitals. Which leads to the last point she raised. Can you have your doctor come over there and be your attending to prevent this situation? And the answer to the question, May, is it depends. It depends on your doctor. My dad has a doctor in a group who 
whose doctors will go to the hospital when you go there and will take over your care. Okay. I don't know how many of them are left, mm -hmm. but he has a, an agreement with those doctors to go over there, particularly his, his personal doctor, to go to the hospital and make sure his care is monitored daily. Now, we've had a new service called concierge service where you can actually pay your physician additional money a fee to come over to the hospital and look over your care and make sure what's being done is proper now there is hmm. another argument to be made about how many you know chefs you want in the kitchen but i want my personal doctor at the hospital i want my personal doctor being the attending making sure that everything's on the up and up but you may have to pay extra to get that service nowadays because it does take time and effort for your doctor to go to the hospital, make rounds, follow your care, and then go back to his office, back to his clinic, and take care of his patients. And you know, you and I have talked about this a lot. These days, it's all about volume. It's all about volume with the doctors. Does the electronic record keeping thing help in any way that everything's on there and your doctor might have it sent over and they can see everything right there it's not all paper anymore and all this it, it can but it kind of goes back to what you were saying how much better is that than telemedicine yeah right I mean if your guy's not there or you're yeah, like what you said reminded me of like telemedicine yeah if, you, if your doctor he or she is not there seeing you flesh <clears throat> to flesh yeah. touch to touch making sure that things are being done properly and he's just looking at you know what's on a on an electronic record yeah that's better than nothing but is that as good as him being there? Absolutely not. And the scary thing is, what if he reads something in the chart and doesn't really understand it fully and conflicts with what the hospitalist is recommending? Then you got a problem. Wow. So really, you're saying right now, any of us going to almost any hospital, except maybe a teaching hospital in rare exceptions, that's what you're going to encounter. So what, what do you suggest? What would you do when you go to, you know you're getting a hospitalist, unless you have your same dad's doctor set up that way. What yeah. are you going to do? Well, that's where the patient advocate comes into play. I'm going to have a family member wife, mm -hmm. brother, whatever. Someone is going to be there with me and making sure every time that doctor makes rounds that that doctor knows the history, knows why I'm there, knows what the, the diagnosis is, and understands clearly what is being done for me so that I'm just not forgotten or there's not a mistake made. And I want to tell you this real quick. I had a case a couple of years ago with a hospitalist. It was one of those shift change situations, and the second hospitalist did not know what test had been ordered for the patient. Hmm. failed to carry it out and as a result that patient left the hospital and died without the test. Ugh. The test would have saved the patient's life. So people I'm telling you this is another <clears throat> reason why you've got to have a family advocate, patient Someone, advocate friend, family, with whatever. you in the hospital. You got to. Good, wow. good question man. Yeah, okay. Let's go to Granger. Granger, good morning. Good morning. Hey, uh, I have sort of a contrarian point of view about telemedicine. Okay. Um, Back in the mid-90s, I was involved in an experiment uh, in Oregon where I lived in a small town 250 miles east of Portland. And uh, I'm a retired licensed clinical social worker, and we could not get doctors in rural areas, similar to here, to, to specialists especially to come into our community. And we converted our whole half the state into a system where we used telemedicine at that time for psych psychiatrists to talk to uh, patients uh, in the community. Uh, I was stationed, I didn't work for the state hospital, but I was stationed in the state hospital. My job was to uh, get people into foster group homes. And rather than sending two staff 250 miles to a group home with one client to drive all that way, stay overnight for that client to visit the group home, we could do this by telemedicine with the mental health staff and the group home staff being in one location me being in the state hospital with the patient and the hospital staff to um, you know to have that interview to see if it was a good fit so i my point is i think we don't need to always bad telemedicine especially in rural areas because we can have access to specialists that we would not have access to otherwise Okay. That's a, I think that's a good point. And I know what he's talking about. I'm from Oregon also, not from that eastern. But in the absence of anything else, I, certainly, I think that's a benefit, right? Well, I see his point. And we have, and we have a lot of rural areas in Tennessee. Sure. Okay. You're right. You're right, sir. All right. Granger's point is well taken. And particularly, <clears throat> psychiatric care is a whole, much, a whole bunch different from attending mm -hmm. care in the hospital. Psychiatrists don't have to do physical assessments. Okay, they're not having to lay hands on you, so to speak. Right. 
So I totally get the psychiatric component of it because that involves more of a talking situation and a review of records. Also agree with Granger, in rural areas where you can't get it, Mm -hmm. Something's better than nothing. I yep. agree, and and maybe the, there's always a balance to these situations. Sure. You can you can calibrate the proper balance. I'm just saying, inside the hospital, yep. what you were talking about in Phoenix, and this was in me, a metropolitan area, to me is unacceptable. Yep. Now I, I I get what Granger's saying, and <clears throat> it probably works fine in a rural setting if that's all you can get. Mm -hmm. Something's better than nothing, and maybe it works well. Yeah. Particularly, with, and I, I totally agree with psychiatric care and where patients have to drive long distances to go see somebody yep. when they can have a discussion over the the uh, computer, that's probably better, mm -hmm. you know, because yep. it takes a long time for a patient to drive somewhere uh, in rural communities to go see someone, see a specialist. I'm just talking more to your point. Yep. If I'm in the hospital and I'm paying all that dough to get good care in a hospital, I am not going to look at a TV and talk to a doctor. Right. And this again, metropolitan area, and it was driven by a major corporation and that you, owns a hospital chain or whatever, and they're finding telemarket, one doctor, all the hospitals, they're making coin. Yeah, and Granger, that is different. What Nick's yeah. talking about is completely different from your situation, which I think is not only a reasonable use of telemedicine, but really what we're going to see in the future. I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, on that note, let's take a break. When we come back, we can take more calls. Uh, Mark was on horn. We just lost him, but if he wants to call back, we'll take him first thing. 737-7587. Final segment with Clint Kelly right after this.